Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Background My family just moved to a new bigger apartment which ended up costing a lot less than we saved so we decided to replace all our appliances and home decor items. After a long day of unloading our storage and carrying everything up to the second floor apartment, I'm exhausted. I still had to go to Walmart to get everything my apartment needs. I was accompanied by my 10 year old son who is a little tall for his age and looks older than he really is. That's important for later. My son and I entered Walmart which is packed and the checkout lines are so long they stretch into the clothes aisle. While my son and I are shopping, he starts playing Pokemon Go on my phone and walks behind me. We finally got everything we needed and headed to the checkout. As I walked around looking for the shortest line, I walked past Karen standing in the closing section, clearly not in line but staring at the checkout. My son and I got in line behind another customer, 10 feet away from where Karen was standing and patiently waited for our turn. Five minutes later, my son excited to show me a new Pokemon he got asks me to try to catch one. Since the line was moving slowly, I figured, why not? He hands me the phone and I attempt to play the game. As I'm trying my second attempt to catch a Pokemon, in comes Karen. I noticed out of the corner of my eye her cart at the front side of my cart. I looked up to see Karen was her back facing me. She was peeking my way trying to be nonchalant and pretend I wasn't there. At first, I didn't say anything thinking she was looking at clothes or waiting for someone. At this point, I'm still playing the game with my son but at the same time, I'm paying more attention to our surroundings and to Karen. As a customer before us moves up in line, we move forward too because at this point Karen is inching closer in between me and the customer now and she's obviously thought I wasn't paying attention because she tried to push her cart in front of mine. I pushed my cart forward which blocked her way and she then proceeded to push her cart into me. Excuse me ma'am, but we are here in line first. You were way over there when we got in line. No, I was in line before you. I was trying to find a manager so I walked over there, but this is still my spot in line. Me clearly knows she's lying. I'm sorry, but that's not how it works. Even if you were in line before, you still stepped out and you were nowhere near this line when I got here. And there was a manager in front of where you were standing but not once in the 20 minutes I've been in line. Have you said a word to anyone nor where are you in any line? Everyone here is in a rush to leave too so please wait your turn at the back of the line. How would you know? You've been looking at your phone the whole time and I was in line first. I was behind this customer in front of you first. You are the one cutting me and if you don't move out of the way I will tell the manager you're cutting me in line. If you don't move, I'll have you thrown out and banned from Walmart. Go ahead, do it, and cry me a river while you're at it. Because I don't care what you say or do, you're not cutting in front of me. You know what, screw you witch. She then starts to walk off after trying to ram me with her cart. My son steps in the way to stop her cart from hitting me but gets hit in his side. Me loudly. Wow, you just hit my son with your cart. You're crazy. If you can't wait in line, don't come to Walmart, Karen. Karen walks off and my son and I think it's the end of it. The customer in front of me is now at the register unloading her cart when Karen returns with the manager. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes? This lady over here told me you cut her in line and threatened to beat her up if she didn't shut up and leave. We don't tolerate that kind of behavior here at Walmart. I am going to have to ask you to leave the store. The manager tells me. I looked at him and was about to explain what really happened when Karen interrupted me. Karen, looking smug, thinking she won, takes it a step further. She also hit me with her cart. I want her arrested for assault. I want a police call that she assaulted me and threatened my life, all because I wouldn't let her skip me. The customer in front of me that was finishing up her transaction turned around looking irritated at the lies Karen was spouting. I have waited in this line for 30 minutes to check out. And at no point were you ever in a line behind me, nor did she ever threaten you. You threatened her and rammed your cart into hers. You threatened to have her removed and banned if she didn't let you in, then you hit her son with your cart. She was well within her rights to stand her grounds. 
The manager, looking confused now, asked me if it was true and both my son and I said yes at the same time. I started to explain my side of what happened, but Karen kept interrupting me. Lies, oh lies. This dumb witch is a liar. She assaulted me. I want her arrested now. Calm down, ma'am. We will get to the bottom of this. But she cuts off the manager. No, I want her arrested now. She screamed at him. Ma'am, you're making a scene. If you don't calm down and lower your voice, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. She threatened my life and assaulted me and you're going to kick me out? I want your manager now. I am the general manager of this tour. If you want anyone above me, you'll have to call corporate. Now ma'am, I'm going to ask you one more time to calm down before I trespass you from my store. Karen, upset that she's not getting her way. So this is how you run your store? You protect violent people who attack other customers and kick out the victims? I'll have your job. Well, you're not the victim here. Her son and her are. You threatened and attacked him because you got caught skipping the line. The nice customer told her. Mind your own business, witch. No one asked you. It is my business. I witnessed everything and I will speak out against disgusting people like you. How dare you speak to me like that, you piece of... That's enough from you, the manager told Karen. The manager, not wanting to deal with Karen anymore, calls the police to escort her out of the store and trespass her. In comes the cool cop of our story. Hey sir, what seems to be the problem? He asked the manager. Well, I have a dispute between... But Karen cutting off the manager with fake tears says... Officer, this woman threatened my life and attacked me for no reason. I want to press charges and I want her arrested now. Officer, she is lying. She attacked my mother and me because we wouldn't let her cut us in line. Shut up, you're a pathetic excuse for a man. Allow this violent mother of yours in public. Karen yells at my son. She is not violent. She is my kind, caring mother. You are the violent one who can't even watch your mouse around kids. You even hit a minor with your cart. I did no such thing. It's true, I witnessed the whole thing. The nice customer was still there and she told the cop. They are lying. They are lying. I was the one attacked. Do you have footage of the incident? The cop asked the manager. Yes, I do. My last prevention guy pulled it up as we were waiting for you to arrive. Karen starts to look nervous and starts making excuses to leave. That'll take too long and I'm in a hurry. But you insisted on the police being cold. Besides, it shouldn't take more than five minutes. But I really have to go, you know? I I'm, I'm in a rush. You haven't even checked out yet, and it looks to be a 20 to 30 minute wait, so there is plenty of time. But I... The cop cutting in. Ma'am, you're currently being detained, and I can't let you leave now. Karen cutting out the cop. You can't detain me. I did nothing wrong. I have rights. From what I understand, you assaulted a minor with a weapon, which is a third degree felony. But... No buts. Now sit quietly while we review the video. Ten minutes later, Karen was arrested for assault of a minor in a third degree, reckless endangerment of a child, disturbing the peace, and she was trespassed from all the Walmart stores. As she was escorted out of the store in cuffs, she just kept yelling she never hit a minor. Her son is ten years old and you assaulted him with your card. I suggest you use your right to remain silent. Everyone has had enough with your foul mouse. The cop took statements from everyone and then took Karen away. The manager apologized for our experience and gave me and my son a $50 gift card each. If convicted, Karen could face up to 5 years in prison and a fine of $10,000 or both. When I was in high school, my family lived quite a way out of town on a small chunk of mostly useless property. There is not much in a Texas panhandle. That did have a very nice little garden and a barn slash junk shed and a small pond stocked with fish. The barn and pond were there when we moved in. The garden and fish were on a the garden and fish were our own additions and products of lots of hard work. Our very first interaction with the neighbors was the entitled parents coming over to inform mine that the previous owners had let their little creeps run loose all over the property and play in the barn and swim and fish in the pond. The last one is very obviously false as there weren't any fish before we put them there. But this isn't about the entitled parents. We really had very little interaction with them. The little creeps were a boy and a girl. I would estimate 8 and 10. In retrospect, those two had issues that definitely weren't helped by their parents' parenting style. 
Our first introduction to the first little creep was getting up one morning, pulling on shoes, and trudging out to leave for school and finding him standing on the end of the short dock, peeing into the pond. None of us could really think of anything to say to that. It only got worse from there. The real problems began with the rabbits. If we got up early, right around sunrise, we would often see rabbits moving around. There was a worm under one corner of the barn. It was a constant battle keeping them out of the garden, but we managed. I was sad but not super shocked to find a couple of rabbits dead in the driveway when I came home one afternoon. There were also coyotes out there and various snakes and raccoons. But then it was another and another and none of them were eaten. It was getting worrisome and creepy, so I finally pulled on some rubber gloves and performed a post-mortem on the next one that turned up. The wounds weren't bites. They were BBs. It took another week to confirm what we guessed. My dad enlisted a friend to help us get all the cars out of the driveway and out of sight while he stayed behind to watch. And sure enough, the little creeps showed up with their BB guns, entirely unsupervised, to kill small animals and leave them lying in our backyard. My dad is six and a half feet tall and was quarterback in high school, and he was hoping that his disappointed face would put a stop to this. It didn't. He went striding out to give them a talking to, and they took off running home. He went after them, but no one would open the door to talk to him. He went over again after he saw their parents come home. Parents didn't answer the door either. He left a note saying that children were not welcome to hunt on a property and requesting money to replace the windows they chipped. They made a call to the local police to, you know, let them know these kids were running around trespassing with firearms. Very big yikes. We caught the first little creep peeing on our lettuce a couple days later. The rabbit slaughter continued, but we weren't able to catch them again. The police actually did pick them up shortly after that for trespassing on a nearby construction site and causing tens of thousands of dollars of damage to the materials and large equipment. We chased them out of the garden a few times, shooed them out of the dock and spent several hours fishing the trash they've been throwing out of the pond. Putting out some fires, they started. We tacked up no trespassing signs, informed the police about the subsequent weirdness, and put additional locks on the barn, because someone, definitely, absolutely not the little creeps, saw the locks off and stole things. But then, it was a nice early summer day, and my dad and sister took a dip in the pond, and they came screaming out of it within half an hour, red and swelling, and we zoomed them off to the ER, where a skin scrape revealed a severe parasite skin infection. I don't remember the name of the microorganism. It was something propagated in the bodies of water snails, which can spit out of the skin and through other tissues and potentially eat your brain. Easily treatable in the US, though. They were put on medication to kill the bugs and spent the next couple of weeks bathing in calamine and oatmeal. We happened to be out in the yard as the entitled neighbor family was piling into their car. One of the few times we had ever seen them only one place at one time, I was in shouting distance. To this day, I don't know if it was true neighborly concern, liability self-covering, or a carefully engineered teaching moment. My mother, bless her, called out, Hey, hey, y'all need to stay out of the pond, okay? They pretended not to hear her, slammed their doors, and drove away. The very next day, we heard screams from the direction of the pond. Yep, we used the microorganisms there to give them a taste of their own medicine. Context. I work at the Bullseye Mart, just past my 5 year anniversary there actually, so I'm pretty familiar with how systems work, like our pickup system. Once someone places an order, it can take anywhere between 2-4 to four hours for it to be ready for pickup. This allows for factors like arrival into our system, prep time, pick time, and other mishaps that happen in retail life. So basically, if you order something at 8am, then your order will be ready anywhere between 10am and 12pm. There is a warning about this when people order online right on a page. But as it turns out, a lot of people are apparently a 19-year-old named Jared. The story. So I show up for my 8-hour service desk shift at 11am to massive relief. 60% of our opening staff called off due to COVID shot-related symptoms and a church crowd, the bane of my existence, 
is starting to trickle in. Resigning myself to a long day in a daiquiri when I get home. 23-year-old baby. I get to work. Five minutes in, the phone starts ringing. I don't pay much attention at first, thinking maybe one of the managers will pick it up when they notice a line curving towards the service desk. And that's when I notice one manager hopping on a lane to help line bust and another pushing an order card. Well, that doesn't bode well. It can be too bad, right? Hey. Why do I suddenly hear boss music? Is I'm working on a line that just keeps growing? The phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing. If it stops ringing for a moment, it starts ringing again. For 45 minutes, the phone keeps ringing. I call out over the walkie for someone, anyone, to at least answer it. But we have literally no one. Finally, once the checkout line is clear, my friend we will call Autumn rushes over and answer the phone. And this is the conversation I hear. Awesome says, Pulls I Mars service desk. Sorry about the wait. How can I help you? Uh, 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 okay, what's the name of the order? All right, let me check really quick. Sorry, ma'am, it's not ready yet, but it says your order should be ready within the next 30 minutes or so. Oh, um, I'm not sure if... I'm not saying it's wrong, I just... Hold on a moment. Awesome turns to me. Can a customer come in and get their order if it's not ready? Me, still working on returns, but still trying to help. So the customer can technically come in and get the item they ordered in store if they know we have it. It's just that they would have to cancel their original online order since they would technically be two separate transactions. Otherwise, it is recommended that they wait until they get the email saying the order is ready. Autumn says okay and she tells the customer on the phone what I just told her. Alrighty then. Again, sorry for the long wait. Have a nice day. Goodbye. And so that was the end of it. Hey, did the boss music just get louder? Ten minutes later, a woman in her mid-thirties carrying a six-month-old daughter in her arms walks up to the service desk. This is the Karen of the story. I say, hi, how can I help you? Hi, I called a bit ago about a pickup order. The girl on the phone says it wasn't ready yet, but I was wondering if it was ready now. Me, remembering Awesome, told her it would be another half an hour at least before it was ready, but not wanting to be rude, I say. Um, let me check. What's the name on the order? She tells me. Alright, let me see. Shock. Horror. Not at all surprising. Her order of an infant life jacket isn't ready yet. Sorry, ma'am, but it's not ready yet. Let me just... But I ordered it at 10 a.m. When the store opened. Why isn't it ready yet? Well, you might have ordered it at 8 a.m., but our system might not have got it until maybe 9 a.m. Why not? Because I'm fairly certain Bullseye Mart's pickup servers are overseas. Karen scoffs. Excuses. Now, I specifically ordered this as a bring it to my car pickup. I didn't want to bring my daughter into the store, and now look at what you made me do. Side note. In my state, we're around 50% immunized against COVID as a population. And we just opened up immunization to 13 and up. Not to mention at this polls I mart, if you've been completely immunized against COVID, it is your choice if you want to wear a mask or not. I've only had the first show, so I still mask up. This woman wasn't wearing a mask, so either she's been immunized or she never liked wearing masks in the first place. 50-50 shots. Also, I've seen babies younger than hers in a store since at least May last year. I tell her, if you'd like, I can call back to our order placement crew and check and see if they have your ordering card. Karen says, why didn't you do that in the first place? Sighing and shooting the baby in her arms, a pitying look. I call back to my co-worker and ask if anyone has an infant life vest in their cart. My manager, let's call her Nevea, answered and said it was in her cart. But it would be another 5-10 to 10 minutes before it was all ready and she was in the middle of a pick patch. Karen, who overheard, starts getting really mad. Why can't she just bring it up to me now? She knows it's mine, so she should just give it to me. Ma'am, our pick patches are set up so that we only know what items to grab first. We don't know who has what order until we go to the bag and label it. Besides, our system still says it's not ready. So we couldn't just give it to you. It would be like Amazon delivering you a package but not charging you. I ordered the item. I waited all morning for it. I want my item. 
And as we told you on the phone, it wasn't ready yet. Now either you can wait 10 minutes and it will be ready, or you can cancel this order and go back and get another one and go through self-checkout or regular lane. I didn't want to come into the store. My daughter is going to get COVID because of you. I want to speak to your manager. That woman you overheard talking about your order? Well, yeah, that was my manager. Evea. She's the only one on the floor right now. I want my item now. I want compensation for this awful customer service. I want what I want. At this point, I notice another line of people forming behind her. All looking fairly annoyed they have to wait. This Karen is still screaming about the injustice of how her order isn't ready even though she ordered it and blah blah blah. So to get to calm her down and to get out of my line, I quickly gave her a free $15 gift card as an apology. I still feel dirty for doing this, but she left me no choice and asked her to wait off to the side. She happily accepts the gift card then begrudgingly steps out of the line to wait. Not even five minutes later, Nevea rushes up and hands the woman her life vest and Karen flounces off before Nevea can finish her sentence. Later, when the closing manager came in, she asked me what happened to her and a gift card I gave her. And after explaining the situation, all she did was suggest the next time something like this happens, I kept the gift card at $10. Which I can understand. As I didn't even want to give her that gift card in the first place. I still feel bad for that baby girl. Growing up with a mother like this. I was in middle school in the 90s. I loved growing up then and even though there were gangs in my area, I generally avoided trouble. One of my classes had this big field trip planned and they had us selling chocolates to raise money for our trip. I was pretty good at it and was selling at a good rate. I would take the bus, public transportation to school and my stop was about two blocks from my home. I got off at my stop one day with my box of chocolates and there was this older kid around 16 to 17 Pretty big for his age hanging out there. He saw me and came towards me. This guy is clearly a gangbanger. Paso comes up to me and says, Hey homie, where are you from? He was asking what gang I was from. It's not the first time I get challenged like this, so I just reply, I don't bang man. I'm just a junior high kid. Paso looks at my box of chocolates and takes it from me. What's this? I tell him it's nothing. It's something for school. He opens the box and sees a bunch of dollars in there. He grabs the bill, around $15, my sales for the day, and takes a bunch of chocolates as well. Tomorrow, you're going to give me $20 more. If you don't, we are going to have a real freaking problem. I walk away feeling scared and pissed off. I realized I'm going to have to pay back the lost money from my birthday money. And I definitely didn't want to give this guy any more money. I think about it and decide I'll get off and a later bus stop from now on, I walk a little more just to avoid this guy. And the next day, this is what I do. I stuff my box in my backpack just in case and I exit about two stops later. I don't see the guy and think I have solved my problem. Then I get to the liquor store a block away from my home and who do I see but this overgrown idiot Payaso. Hey man, you didn't forget about me, did you? I said, look man, I don't have any money right now. I don't even have my chocolates. I left him at home. Well, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, let's go to your house then. And you're going to give me the money or something else if you don't got it. I begin getting real nervous. My mom is at work and my grandma is home. I definitely don't want to bring him home with her there. I glance at him and notice the tattoos on his arms. At this point, I saw the perfect opportunity for malicious compliance. I tell him, I don't think that's a good idea. Why don't you just let me go, man? Payaso grabs me by the collar and says, I tell you what to do and you freaking do it. You understand? I nod my head and tell him to follow me. Now it's time to give a little background. My neighbor that lived in the house next to mine was a veterano. A veteran of one of the biggest, most notorious gangs in the city. He was in his 40s and a real chill dude. He loved my grandma because she would often share plates of food she made with him and his wife. And he was fond of me because I taught his 8-year-old boy how to play baseball. His son had a disability. The problem was one of his legs. So most other kids wouldn't play with him, but I often did. Let's call my neighbor OG. OG always had a bunch of guys over at his house. 
He made sure they never caused problems and they were all respectful towards my family in particular. Back to Bayaso. The tattoos on his arms? Well, I realized he was from the same gang as OJ. I have a big smile as I'm walking home and Bayaso asks me, Why are you smiling, Bendejo? Idiot. I say, no reason, and keep walking home. As we get closer, I see a bunch of guys hanging out at OG's house. Payaso narrows his eye and smiles as he recognizes some of the guys. We get to OG's house and Payaso says, Wait here, Pinejo, let me talk to my homies. OG is sitting on his porch and Payaso starts greeting some of the guys and then heads towards OG and greets him in a reverential manner. OG notices me and says my name. Hey, OB, what's up? Payaso turns to look at me and I say, Payaso told me to wait here, I have to go home and give him money. OG stands up and says, Why do you have to give him money? I say because he told me yesterday at my bus stop that the $15 and chocolates he took from me wasn't enough and I had to give him more today. Payaso begins to speak. You know this kid, OG? OG gives him the scariest look I've ever seen and tells him to shut the hell up. OG looks back at me and asks, Is this from the chocolates you're selling? I said yes. OG asks me how many chocolates I have left to sell. I say about 50. He tells me not to worry. Payaso is going to pay me for the 50 I have left, plus 20 for the day before, and an extra 50 for my trouble. He tells me to keep whatever else I sell. He tells me to go home, and Payaso will be back later with my money. About an hour later, there is a knock on my door, and Payaso has an envelope and says, Here is $120, little homie. I screwed up. I'm sorry. Do you have Nintendo? I brought you some games. I just stood there stunned and thinking how I never would have guessed that getting robbed had so many benefits. I didn't see Payaso too many times after that, but whenever I did, he would wave at me and never bothered me again. Back in the day, I was a field tech for an IT company. My teammates and I were contracted to an aluminum mill in the upper left hand corner of America. The place was huge and it's the only place that I've worked as an IT guy where I had to put on a hot suit to go in certain areas as a part of my job. So one day I get this ticket for a computer that wouldn't turn on out at the other end of the plant. So I grab a power supply and head off in a golf cart. No joke, this place was so big. We had golf carts to get around. Important later is the fact that we used paper tickets with all the information for the call app printed on the ticket, with space for use to write what was done and so on. We bring the resolved tickets back to the manager and he put the data into a wacky access database for tracking. I get out there and sure enough, the power supply is deader than mashed potatoes. I even tested with a multimeter to verify. I swap the power supply, the machine powers up, I update my ticket, and off I go to the headquarter. End of the day comes eventually and I hand off my fistful of tickets. The next day around lunchtime I get some of my tickets back from the manager with a note, needs more detail. I point out to the guy that there is not much more detail to be had, using the power supply ticket as an example. Test power supply, test bed, replace power supply, PC powers on as normal. But he wasn't having it though. He accepted the tickets back but made sure that I understood that I needed more details of my tickets. Okay, fine. Later in the afternoon I get a call for a bad floppy drive. Perfecto. I grab a floppy drive off the shelf and race out in the golf cart. Upon arrival I do my normal test slash diagnose slash replace slash update process with the exception of adding excruciating details to the ticket. Attempt read of two known Good floppy disks. Insert floppy number one in drive. Attend their command. Unable to read disk. Remove floppy number one from drive. Insert floppy number two in drive. Attend their command. Unable to read disk. Remove floppy number two from drive. Power down system by pressing the power button on the front right corner. Disconnect and remove monitor. Disconnect VGA cable from PC. Disconnect power cable from monitor. Remove monitor to safe location next to desk. Remove top case from PC. Remove left-handed case screw with 14 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx bit screwdriver. Remove left-hand case 
screw with 16 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx pit screwdriver. After screwing screws in safe location, remove top case by sliding forward. Secure top case to safe location next to desk. Remove failed floppy drive from PC. Disconnect data cable from 3.5 inch floppy drive. Remove front lift screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx pit screwdriver. Remove back lift screw from floppy drive with 11 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx pit screwdriver. Remove front right screw from floppy drive with 13 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx pit screwdriver. Remove back right screw from floppy drive with 12 counterclockwise rotations using prescribed Torx pit screwdriver. Slide filled floppy drive forward to remove from drive cage. And so on. The process documentation went on like this, filling the entire front of the ticket and continuing on to fill the back of the page. It was a thing of beauty. It took me about 20 minutes to write this all out, describing the replacement of a floppy drive in excruciating detail. At the end of the day, I turned in my stack of completed tickets to the manager with a smile and a wave. Next morning, as we do every morning, we have a quick team powwow to discuss any special items that need attention for the day, things to watch out for, things we missed previously, and so on. Kind of like a scrum before there was such a word as scrum. During this meeting, the manager begins talking about proper documentation of tickets. He holds up my masterpiece and plainly states that this is a bit much. Just note on your tickets in a quick and concise manner what the problem was or what you did to fix it. Nobody ever got the business again for not being detailed enough on their tickets. This whole situation is so insane. I was an art officer in a university club where the president was negligent in almost all planning. Guy absolutely sucked at planning events, managing conflict, writing documents and so on. So most of the time that stuff fell to me as a second oldest member there. I wrote nearly all the meeting, documents, planned social details, checked in with everyone and volunteered a lot of my time in making free art for the club. For context, he was so bad at time management he thought the officers could plan a huge 50 plus member event in a little under a week and a half. I was told I needed to do better by him and left the club, because who wouldn't ask for something like that? I spent over 128 plus hours of work on creating designs, rendering drawings, recoloring assets for them, on top of managing administrative work he conveniently forgot to do. He begged me to come back. I shouldn't have, but I did. Things didn't get better. I left the server permanently after my term was over, figured that was it. I didn't want my work used for the club anymore. It was voluntary work, not a part of my job description. You'd think I should be entitled to my artwork? President threw a fit after he found out I removed my designs from the Google Drive and reported me to the university claiming I deleted crucial documents from the drive, conveniently leaving out that they were documents I created. Everything's worked out because the club always had a precedent of allowing artists to pull their work at any point. Also conveniently left out by him in his report. But I still can't believe he felt my artwork belonged to him after how he treated me. Update. After reporting me for removing my art, I sent the club a formal notice to remove all of my work. Guy removed half of the work but kept some stuff up. So I sent a warning notice a week later letting him know if it wasn't removed, I'd be contacting the university to file a complaint. Frankly speaking, I only sent a warning because I really didn't want to go through the process of actually reporting the organization. I should have just gone ahead and reported him silently. But it didn't sit well with me. He may not have given me courtesy of a heads up. Something a club's constitution explicitly says is required because disciplinary action but I didn't feel right doing the same thing. Though that would be that, issue's over. We both can move on with our lives. I get an email from him two weeks later. In it, he says he's declined my request to have my artwork removed. My work belongs to the organization, and if I want, we could have a mediated discussion to come to a civil conclusion to our unfortunate disagreement. Funny how it's turned into an unfortunate disagreement after he attempted to have me punished by the university for my own work. 
Worst case scenario, I could have lost scholarships over this. I didn't, everything worked out well, but this level of escalation was grossly unjustified. Doubly ironic, this club was a place that claims to support artists. So now I am meeting with a university lawyer to see what I can do about this. Here's hoping things work out. I have a ton of evidence disproving I ever signed my works rights away. To be continued.